Okay, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're pleased to have as our keynote speaker today, Dr. Angela Desjardins, uh, Professor of Physics uh, at Montana State University. She's also the director of uh, Montana Space Grant Consortium and the Montana NASA EPSCOR, and, and also a leader for uh, the Nationwide Eclipse uh, Ballooning Project. Um, uh, so with this group, you probably don't need much of an introduction, Angela, but again, thank you very much for joining us today. The title of her talk, Nationwide Eclipse Ballooning Project, where we've been and where we're going. Angela? Awesome, thank you. Yeah, so I think I probably know a lot of you, but um, not everyone that's here is part of the Nationwide Eclipse Spooning Project. So when putting this presentation together, I tried to kind of keep in mind that not everyone knows about the Nationwide Eclipse Spooning Project. Um, so giving a little bit of background and maybe even those who are part of the uh, project might learn something that they didn't know before, but then also trying to speak a little bit to, or, to the people who are, are part of the project and not just repeat old information. So we'll see if I can <laughs> I can bridge that, that um, difference. Anyway, so I wanted to just talk a little bit about this first slide. Actually, I think a lot of times folks put up the partners or the first slide and it's not really meaningful in in any way it's just the the title slide but actually i wanted to talk about this a little bit because what's on this slide is actually pretty important to me and um, i think to the project so in the background is a picture actually from the 2017 total solar eclipse and uh speaks to the fact that the project started with that particular eclipse and then we have our, our logo, which was designed by a student um, on the left here as part of our logo design contest. And that was just a really uh, fun um, process. And then the top row of logos here represent the main groups that are sponsoring the project. So this is a NASA sponsored project. And in particular, we're part of the Science Mission Directorate and a program within the Science Mission Directorate called Science Activation, or sometimes people call it SciAct for short. There are actually about 40 different projects under Science Activation, and about five of them are actually specifically focused on the eclipse, and other ones are more long going and, and not focused on the eclipse. And then I have the Montana Space Grant logo. Um, you know, I am the director for Montana Space Grant and Montana NASA EPSCOR, um, but also Space Grant nationally is a big um, sponsor of the project because we have some national support from the headquarters office, but also I know a lot of our teams are um, assisted by their space grants as well. And then all of the other logos represent all of the different organizations that are vitally important to making sure that this effort is a success. We um, have all of our different pod leads for our atmospheric science and engineering tracks, um, plus our subject matter e experts, et cetera. Um, so big thanks to all of them for making this complicated um, project a success. Okay, so um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about why we're we're doing what we're doing. So I think this is something that drives me in a lot of what we do. You know, the classes that students take um, at their colleges and universities are important background information. But of course, when we think about taking next steps, whether that be to further education like graduate school or into the workforce, it's important to have some hands-on experience, I think, for even knowing if the field that a person has chosen is actually a good match for them, but then also for being ready to enter the workforce and, and being a valuable employee. And to do that, you know, to really get a good understanding, I think it's important to go beyond the classroom. And of course, not every student has the opportunity to go beyond the classroom. And I think we need to do a lot more work to try and provide those opportunities. So fortunately for the about 700 students who are part of this project, they're, they're getting that beyond the classroom experience. And I think that's important um, to not just tell them or, or show them about something, but actually really involve, involve them. 
So I wanted to just talk a little bit about the background of the project for those who are not aware. So we really started working on this in 2014, um, coming up with a crazy idea to try and live stream the view of the shadow on the earth um, during the 2017 eclipse. And, you know, a lot of people said we were totally crazy. You know, what were we thinking? Tried to do something like that. Um, some of you might have been actually pretty young in 2014, um, but those of you who remember, that's actually when live streaming was just coming into being. Um, you know, YouTube Live, et cetera, were, were just coming in, into being in, you know, 2014 through 2017. And so the fact that we were going to try and do this on a, you know, very small budget um, was maybe a little bit crazy and it, it was super challenging. Um, but we did it. Of course, there was a variety of um, levels of success, but everyone, I think, had at least some success. And we had um, 55, uh, what we can now call the engineering teams for that eclipse. And then we also had eight uh, more atmospheric science focused teams. And we were sponsored by NASA and that particular project um, as well. And uh, so we were seen by 650 million people who um, saw the, the broadcast because we were included in that. And we were the first to live stream a total solar eclipse from a space-like perspective and first to fly a constellation of balloons across the continent. But then after that 2017 eclipse, we started to think a little bit more about what was the science that we could do, you know, putting these balloons up into the stratosphere, let us start thinking a little bit more about, okay, we can do more than just the basic um, gee whiz, you know, live streaming. There's some really great science that can be done. And so we shifted focus a little bit. And with the 2019 eclipse in Chile, we got a small National Science Foundation or NSF grant to take the team down there. And we're focused again on trying to understand the atmospheric response to the cold, dark shadow of the eclipse. And it had been theorized since the 1970s that this cold, dark shadow could generate special gravity waves. And um, you all are pretty in tune with gravity waves, all of you who are involved in the Nationwide Eclipse Ballooning Project. Um, but something I normally say when I'm talking to other groups about this, and if you're doing outreach, et cetera, and might actually mention that you're working on gravity waves, I think it's important to make the note that when we say gravity waves, that's very different from gravitational waves, right? So often because gravitational waves have been in the news quite a bit, when you say gravity waves, people might think you're talking about gravitational waves, which are generated by like interacting black holes and they're, you know, very tiny little ripples in the fabric of space. And so that might be the thing that first comes to mind when you're um, talking to a crowd that isn't um, eclipse ballooning crowd. So it's important to, I think, uh, note that. And um, anyway, I'm, I'm getting sidetracked, but so it's been theorized since the 1970s that there would be these special gravity waves generated um, during a total solar eclipse. So we set out to measure that and indeed um, measured it and had the first ever detection of stratospheric gravity waves um, induced by a total solar eclipse from the um, 2019 eclipse. Um, so actually had a nature paper published, which if you're familiar with um, journals, academic journals and that kind of thing, um, uh, publishing in nature is a pretty big deal. And so uh, from that success, we set about trying to take advantage of the eclipse in December 2020 that happened to be in South America again and got a bigger grant from the National Science Foundation to take four groups down to, to Chile. And uh, well, it was challenging because a little thing happened in 2020, you might remember. <laughs> that made it uh, very challenging to, to try and take teams down there. And, and unfortunately, the Kentucky team was unable to travel to South America because their institution um, just couldn't let the students go. But they played a really important role with uh, taking in the data and everything and helping um, from, from the US. 
And we, you know, tried to set out to show that we could measure from several different locations and refine the procedure of launching the radio songs and to repeat the results that we saw from 2019 or show that we saw uh, gravity waves again. Unfortunately, you know, this particular picture that I have here shows it looking very nice and sunny, but um, unfortunately, actually, there was an atmospheric river in the area at the time, um, which is pretty much like it sounds, huge deluges of rain, and not really complicated, uh, trying to just, you know, detangle what was going on with the eclipse effects from the atmospheric river effects. So there's actually been some, you know, great data because this is actually like the best data set ever on what's going on in the atmosphere during an atmospheric river. Um, so, um, but there's been some great publications and I think they're still working on some publications from 2020. So then that brings us to the current effort. So nature handed us a very nice set of eclipses, um, both the two total solar eclipses seven years apart, and then two um, very nice eclipses within the US six months apart. So of course, um, we had the annular eclipse in October and then the total solar eclipse um, in April. So just a wonderful opportunity that we definitely needed to take advantage of. So this is a graphic that we put together for the proposal um, to get funding from NASA for the current effort. And I'm not going to talk through all of this, but what we're trying to capture here is really all of what is trying to be done with, with the project. And the thing I want to point out is that one thing that makes our project unique, I mean, unique in general, um, but unique even in terms of a science activation project, or, you know, some would call us a citizen science project, which it, it's not exactly a citizen science project if you think about the, the definitions of that. But anyway, the, the project is unique because we're really both a science effort and an education project. We really could have pursued funding this project um, in you know, a purely science way because the science that we're doing is so important, trying to understand uh, the atmospheric response and, and several other things to, to the eclipse. Um, but obviously we're doing this science involving students and um, in that way, it makes it an education project. Well, it turns out the funding that we have through science activation is an education project, which puts a little bit more focus, of course, on trying to make sure that we're providing an opportunity for the students that is, that is rich, um, that understands all of the needs of the various institutions, et cetera. So I'm, I'm actually very glad that the project was funded as an education project, but we don't wanna lose sight of, of the fact that the science that we're producing is, is really important and, and really very valuable. So here's a snapshot. This is a relatively new graphic that we put together, um, trying to show how our teams are spread across the country. And so you can see the key there. Um, we have the engineering teams in blue and the atmospheric science in, in yellow. And um, something that's important to us that um, we definitely try to, to emphasize is that 32% um, of our 75 institutions, so we have 53 teams, but of course, um, many of the teams have more than one institution. So 32% of the 75 institutions are minority serving institutions and 15% are community colleges, um, which is, is good. We really want to try and great opportunities where there weren't opportunities before um, and in places where there were ballooning programs or things like that in the past, um, we want to bring a new, a new flavor to those programs. Um, again, those of you who are familiar with the program know this, we have two tracks, Atmospheric Science, um, where teams fly small radio songs, which is exactly like the National Weather Service does twice a day every day to understand what's going on in the atmosphere and give us our weather. And then the engineering teams, which are also trying to understand a little bit about what's going on in the atmosphere, but also providing live streaming of the view from the edge of space. And we of course have a lot of challenges with this program, but 
those challenges really make the project worthwhile. I think that if you thought about participating in a project where it was not really challenging, where things were simple and straightforward, the participation wouldn't be nearly as valuable, right? You'd just be kind of carrying out something that um, was ordinary. And what, again, we're trying to do here is to, to do something new and different, and, and that's challenging. But we want to give everyone the opportunity to, you know, do what we ask them to do, but to also do their own ideas and um, make solutions to challenges that involve their imagination. That's an, it's an important part of the project. So again, you know, most of us um, here know what's going on, but one of the main things that we're trying to understand is the gravity waves or the response of, of the atmosphere. And that's important in the big, the big picture because gravity waves really dominate the, the mixing that's happening in, in the atmosphere, the, the energy transport. And understanding our atmosphere in general, um, you know, helps us understand things like climate change and 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 really, there's a, an important bigger picture here that this data set um, will provide and, and be studied for a long time. So, for the engineering side, folks, you you may not truly understand, but it's really pretty powerful on the atmospheric science side that are launching. 30 radio songs, you know, one an hour every hour, 24 hours before the eclipse and, and six hours after. And then the data rate is so fast in that there's really vast amounts of data. And then on the engineering side, um, the video evidence and picture evidence, as well as all of the rich uh, precision GPS data, et cetera. Um, so collectively, it's a really wonderful data set that will be analyzed for a long time. So um, again, I'm still in the uh, looking back um, top part of the talk. And so just wanted to throw a few pictures up here, pulled from the teams. You know, of course there's hundreds of, of pictures and we, we love seeing all of your pictures and just pulled a few that I thought were particularly nice here. Um, you know, we have the one from um, St. Kate's uh, here in the upper left where they got the radio sound um, and the partial eclipse in the photo, that's wonderful. I really like this engineering one here from Wyoming where you can see the balloon shredding. Um, and then of course, just some very nice pictures of, of teams um, working on everything. And so again, I think everyone had some great success. Everything might not have gone perfectly, but uh, we learn more from our um, mistakes than, than we do when everything goes right. Uh, here's just a quick snapshot, um, which I think is just a, a great little GIF video showing uh, the engineering balloons, right? So we have trackers on the engineering balloons. And for those um, in the atmospheric science side who are maybe not used to looking at this, you know, green is on the ground or low altitude, um, orange is approaching commercial airspace, red is in commercial airspace, and blue is above that where um, the commercial planes don't reach. So it's kind of fun. You can exactly see where the path of annularity was um, and the balloons um, progressing as the eclipse happened. This is a little bit of data, which I'm actually not going to talk too much about because um, Genevieve talked about this at the beginning of our session this morning. Um, but just basically, you know, there's other things besides gravity waves. Um, like the difference how long the temperature minimum leg is from the solar radiation leg. Um, and the picture in the background here, by the way, is from um, one of the teams who are in Oregon and saw they saw these um, gravity waves in the atmosphere. This is this is from the ground, though. And then just a really wonderful video from um, the Montana balloon. Um, and then on the right here is actually, um, again, from the ground, but a nice um, series of pictures um, from Utah of the annular eclipse. And if you haven't watched the NEDP annular eclipse video, um, the link is, is there, um, and it's actually on the, the website as well. I encourage you to watch that if you haven't. Okay, so now um, I'm turning a little bit to where we're going. So um, one thing I wanted to highlight is we have the Eclipse speaker series happening. So we have a talk every week um, at various times and days so that 
you can't go to one, hopefully you can go to another um, between now and the eclipse. Um, we've had um, two already and we have uh, 10 or 12 lined up. Um, the next one is on Thursday next week. And I just wanted to mention that if you're not on an uh, NEBP team, you're still invited to attend. You can go to our website, click on the Quaker um, speaker series page, and you're invited to register and attend these talks. Um, they're they're open, um, although you do have to register. So I, I don't know, probably everyone has thought a little bit about this, but I thought I would just talk a little bit about the time of day. So in central Texas, totality will be at about 1.35 p.m. in central time. And it takes the eclipse from when the eclipse enters um, in the U.S. and then exits um, in Maine uh, is just about an hour um, is how long it takes for the path of totality to, to cross um, to the north. Um, and in central Texas, they'll experience about four and a half minutes of totality. And then um, about a half hour later, it'll reach Indianapolis and they'll be down to about three and a half minutes of totality at the maximum in the center line of um, the path. And then in northern Maine um, in, in eastern time, about 3.30 p.m., and they'll experience about three and a half minutes of totality near the center line. So now I just wanted to shift a little bit. You know, um, hopefully almost everyone on this call will actually get to be in the path of totality, but these broadcasts are actually really important for those people who can't be in the path of totality. Um, and as maybe I'm going to talk about in a minute, if you are in the path of totality, but it's cloudy, um, it might actually be nice to be able to um, see the live telescope view, for example, um, and just kind of watch what's going on in the NASA broadcast um, as you have time in between tasks, etc. Um, so the Nationwide Eclipse Ballooning Project will be featured in a couple of different ways on the, the NASA broadcast. So that's going to be great. And then for those who are going to be in How do you not Junction, have speakers Texas, on your computer? Oh, there is. Um, it's not. Sorry, I think someone is maybe not muted. But um, for those um, five teams will be in Junction, Texas, will be with the Explorer Exploratorium. And there'll be some teams who will be talking on the Exploratorium um, uh, broadcast that they'll be doing, and they'll be doing one in English and one in Spanish. Do you have those? Type and of, just you don't to have that type of note like that um, there will be. So I don't know if if there's folks who aren't muted. If you could mute, that'd be great. Um, NASA is expecting one billion viewers um, to watch the NASA broadcast. So that's pretty. <laughs> Pretty impressive and maybe a little nerve wracking at the same time that, you know, our project um, is going to be seen by a billion people that that is just pretty incredible. Um, and then, I, yeah, I already mentioned that the Exploratorium will have English and Spanish broadcasts. So this is a picture of where we'll be. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the map on our website, but this is a snapshot um, showing just the different um, locations and the uh, yellow is engineering teams and then the blue are um, atmospheric science teams. I wanted to just share this. Uh, I know Genevieve and a couple others mentioned about, about cloud cover. Um, just to manage expectations a little bit, um, you know, I think it's important for us to take a minute to make sure we're enjoying totality even if it's cloudy, right? So this map shows the expected cloud cover, the average cloud cover across um, the US during April, on April 8th. Uh, so you can see in Texas is about the best chance. Um, and part of the reason that uh, there's gonna be so many teams in Junction, Texas is because the Exploratorium um, picked that site and, and found it. And um, they're also actually a science activation team and so that actually has in the location in Junction, Texas, um, west of Austin and San Antonio has the best chance of having um, clear skies. But then as you go more to the Northeast, you can see that there's a much higher chance of, of cloud cover. So like in Maine, almost 100% chance of it um, being completely cloudy. But do your best uh, to enjoy it uh, because even if it is 
in the path, even if it is cloudy, it'll get dark and it'll be weird and uh, it'll be an experience. So I wanted to mostly end here with just a little bit of advice. And you know, some of this is taken from the lessons learned from the annular eclipse. And some of it is just um, experience from our past um, eclipse campaigns. So one of the things is to do practice scenarios and we don't necessarily mean practice flights, right? Um, I think some of the teams talked about like St. Francis talked about pretending like you're doing a balloon flight and pretending the timing, et cetera. And I think those um, practicing like that can be can be really valuable. Another one is to really do some stressful situation training. And we're actually going to be um, sharing a whole new NEBP lesson here soon, um, pulled from a bunch of different sources, et cetera, to help with doing team training and stressful situations because um, as you may be experienced in the annular eclipse, but probably even more so in the, the total eclipse. Um, stressful situations can bring out uh, conflict um, and conflict is okay, right? But if you have worked ahead of time on how to deal with that, then um, you can deal with it better um, at the moment. Uh, one of the other lessons learned that came out of the annular eclipse is that uh, like, checklists and packing lists and things like that were not as detailed as they needed to be or, or operation lists. And so taking time to make sure that you've thought of all of the packing and operation uh, checklists that, that you need um, can be really helpful. I encourage folks, um, there are some teams who have done this really well, and that's great. I encourage you to keep doing that. Um, but other teams haven't necessarily or haven't shared that with us. But to reach out to your local media, um, most most places, especially with your local news, are going to be super excited to share um, with the community about what you're what you're doing and that you're going to be part of this big national effort that's sponsored by NASA. Um, so definitely do that if you haven't already. And then outreach, we've heard about some outreach today, which is absolutely wonderful. It's actually, if you go back and look at the documentation um, for being part of the project, it's actually a requirement that every team do at least one outreach event. Um, and it doesn't have to be anything too major, but it is something we want you to do. We want you to share what you're doing with your community. Um, and it can be during the eclipse or it can be just um, beforehand in your community. And then, as I mentioned in the chat earlier, just making sure to share um, that with us so we have the um, data about the outreach that you did. And then, as I said before, just making sure to pause and enjoy. Uh, totality is, is important. It's going to be a little crazy, but make sure you um, pause and enjoy the experience as well. Um, so that's all I wanted to share. And I've um, put our website here. We have, you know, of course, lots of resources on the website um, and the contact information is there as well if anyone has any questions or needs to reach out. So thanks. And um, Hopefully that wasn't just a total boring repeat of information that you you already knew. Well, thank you very much, Angela. And we do have time for uh, some questions. I'm monitoring the chat window uh, so you can type your questions in or open up your mic and ask questions for Angela. Uh, one, one comment I had uh, during the uh, 2017 eclipse, the uh, primary APRS tracking channel on the ham radio was completely jammed. So we had to use an alternate cha channel direct down to a ground station. So uh, I posted a map showing, uh, I did a screenshot of all the live tracks of the eclipse balloons in the chat there. Awesome, yeah, that's, that's part of why we're not using APRS or ham, ham radio, because when you go up high, you hit lots of repeaters and you overload things and, and the ham community who are not doing balloons get really mad at you. Uh, so yeah, we're really definitely trying to steer clear of that because it can really cause a lot of problems. And also, you know, of course, ham radio is used in emergency situations sometimes. And if our balloons are jamming, you know, overloading the ham radio and those emergency things can't get through, then you know, of course, there's different bands and things, but yeah. So are you going to lead a project in the 2044 eclipse? 
<clears throat> well, the 2020, the 2044 eclipse is just in a very small part of the U.S., but most of it's in Montana. <laughs> so, I mean, I have no idea if I'll still be here in Montana and what I'll be doing in 20 years, but we'll see. <laughs> but the next main eclipse that goes more across the U.S. is in 2045, um, so soon after that. Mm -hmm. I know, Eric, yeah, 1 billion is crazy, but but NASA is pretty sure that they'll I'll have a, a billion people. You all are going to be seen by a billion people. <laughs> Pretty crazy. There's an eclipse crossing Minnesota in 2099, and we've already talked a couple schools into canceling class for that day. <laughs> yeah, you got to do it early. That should hopefully be early enough. <laughs> Angela, I noticed uh, two dots on your map in Northwest Ohio. I'd like to hook up with them because that's where I was planning to go for the eclipse. That's my hometown. Okay, I'll I'll throw the um, our eclipse website in the chat, and then you can look at maps, and then the twenty um, twenty four locations, and then you can click on the little things, and it tells you what the teams are, and then we can give you the the contact info. Yeah. Any other questions for Angela? Oh yeah, so Wyoming is one of them. I don't know if you saw that, Bill. Thank you, Angela. Yep. Yes, thank you, Angela.